relationship with God, whatever that is, invite them to come. Tell them, it's not going to be church as usual. It's going to be different. And uh, I think that they're going to find that uh, during that time that they can meet the Lord in a very special and a very unique way. So I want to invite you to come and be a part of that as well. A lot going on this next month. Amen. And I hope you are praying and prepared and ready for what God is going to do. Let's pray. We're going to give our offering. What I want you to do is just bring your offering up. Just set it on the table here. And it's going to go to help do the work that we're doing. And uh, believe God for good things to come. Okay, so let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessing that you have provided for us. Thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to share. We just ask your blessing, Lord, upon our time of giving today. And, Lord, as we prepare our hearts now to uh, move into this next uh, part of the service, we just ask you to uh, speak to us in a very special way. And, God, thank you for the testimonies. Thank you, God, for healing. Thank you, Lord, for moving upon hearts. And we just give you all the glory. We give you all the praise and the honor in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Bring your offering up front, if you will. Go ahead, and then while you're doing that, just go around and shake hands with somebody and tell them, hey, I'm glad to see you in God's house today. Thanks for coming out today. Amen. Oh, yeah, bring that candy up here. That's fine, too. We'll take that, too. That's a part of your offering. Praise the Lord. A few weeks ago, Brother Oscar and a, a few of the folks from here, Jubilee, went to a seminar and uh, went to a, a, a basic training on what we're wanting to embark on. And uh, I'm going to let Brother Oscar share in just a few minutes about uh, what, uh, what he had uh, picked up on. But I want us tonight, I want us to, to, to uh, think about the story of man. How many of you remember reading in the Bible about Matthew, the tax collector's conversion? Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew in the Bible. Matthew, the guy Matthew. First book of the Bible, Matthew. Amen. Can you hear me? Am I not loud enough? You want me to talk louder? All right. Well, you know, i got to wake you up because you all sound like, act like you're sleeping out there. Um, well, if you know anything about Matthew's conversion, you know that Matthew was a tax collector. You know that Matthew was not well liked among the community but he was he was a pretty good guy among his tax collector friends and and Matthew had an encounter with Jesus Christ and it t it changed his life he went from being a tax collector to being a follower of Jesus and it happened in one moment he had that that unique encounter with with Christ and it literally changed his whole life but didn't that happen to you you had an encounter with Christ, your whole life was changed, right? Matthew was so taken by the fact that his life was different that he wanted everyone that he knew that was personal friends with his to have the same kind of an encounter with Jesus Christ. And so Matthew got together with, got, got a plan, put a plan together, and he decided that he was going to have all of his friends come to his home and have just have a big party at his house. And so he got, had this big gathering, and he brought all of his tax collector friends, and he invited Jesus and his disciples to come and be a part of it. Now, I don't know if you, if you can, can picture in your mind uh, what this meeting must have been like, this, this gathering must have been like, but it, it was, it's pretty obvious by what the Word says that Matthew probably was a pretty good party guy he probably could throw some pretty good parties. Because the Bible says that it, people came. They were all there. In fact, it was such a big event that even the religious people, the Pharisees even showed up during the event. So here was Jesus and his disciples and Matthew and Matthew's friends. And the, the, the objective that Matthew had was that he wanted his friends to be able to meet Jesus Christ in the same way that he met Jesus and so there he is with all of his friends in that room, and they're having a great time, and Jesus is encountering all these people. The disciples are encountering all these people, and they're getting to experience Christ in a personal way 
in a way that they probably would never, ever encounter Christ, but they encountered Christ that way because Matthew was willing to do what he did best, something he could do. And a lot of times when it comes to doing uh, things for God, a lot, of, a lot of times we say, well, you know, I can't do it like the preacher can do it. I can't do it like my Sunday school teacher or my youth leader. I can't do it like that. But there's things that I can do. And, you know, one of the things that's unique about being a believer in Christ is that God wants us to take what we can do and use it for His glory. Amen. And, and for some folks, some folks are really given to hospitality. They love having people at their house. And they love being able to prepare and plan and put it together. And, and, and they do it, and they do it with, with you know, and, and they invite their friends over for all kind of family, whoever it is. They just invite them over, and they, they sit, and they talk, and they share, and they have all these things. But many times in those kinds of encounters, we never really stop to think about that the real reason that we need to encounter these individuals is because they need a change of heart like we had a change of heart. Amen. Because we don't, always, we don't always take the time to tell people. And we got this idea that, that you know, uh, as long as I just live my Christian life around people, they'll see and therefore they'll know and they'll come to Christ that way. And I got, you know, I got news for you that's probably not going to happen. Because just because you live it, doesn't, just because you live it on the outside, doesn't necessarily mean that they can actually know the change has happened on the inside. Because what happens is that your testimony is what makes the difference in the lives of people that you come in contact with. Not just because you live it out there, but because you actually share it. In fact, the Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by what? The word of our testimony. Not the silence of our testimony, but by the word of our testimony. We overcome because we are, listen, because we are willing to tell people what Christ has done for us. Because we're willing to talk to them. We're willing to, 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 to maneuver our life around in such a way that we can find opportunities to help people to know and understand Jesus Christ. We talk about a lot of stuff in this world. You, I, I guarantee you, in your day-to-day, you probably talked about a dozen or more things in your day. But ask yourself this question. In this day of mine today, did I talk to somebody about Christ? Did I say something that would impact the eternal part of the individuals that I touch every day of my life? Because that really is what matters most. It doesn't really matter if you say, well, you know, it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day today. It's a great opportunity to say, yeah, it's a beautiful day today. You're right, man. Wow, great it is. Yeah, you know, God really blesses us with wonderful opportunities like this. And you can turn a conversation that was simply about the weather into something that talks about the God that you serve. Now, you know as well as I do that we live in a world that is constantly bombarding us and the, and the, rest, of, the rest of the communities around us with all kinds of other types of agendas. And most of the agendas that are out there right now, what's the, big, what's the biggest agenda thing right now that's going on in our world, in our, in, our, in our world, not around the world, but in the American world, Western culture? Yeah, the health care issue, the health care. Health care is a huge issue right now, is it not? If you don't think it is, all right, wait till October because I'll tell you what, next month when you all have to start go scurrying around trying to figure out what it's all about, you'll know it's a big deal. It is a big deal. It's a big deal. A lot of people on both sides of the aisle are trying to figure out what to do with this, whether or not it needs to happen. But then you take that and you break it down and you move it into other things. What's another big agenda in our culture right now? Yeah, the same-sex marriage issue. All right? Let me tell you something about the same-sex marriage issue. In, a, in another year or two, it will no longer be an issue for the rest of the communities around us. It will be the norm. All right? In fact, probably in your circle of relationships, you probably know someone who knows someone that is in a same-sex relationship. That's how close it's getting to your life. And in fact, truth is that many people in their own families have these kinds of things happening. And many times we as believers, we're like, 
we don't even know what to say about it because we don't hardly ever hear anyone talk about it. And yet the Bible talks a lot about it. And we need to know how to relate Christ into those situations. So many things that happen in, in our lives, in our world, have eternal weight to them. They weigh on the eternal things of a person's life. People that are broken, people that are hurting. Many times, you know, people on the outside carry on like the, everything's perfectly fine. You'll encounter them in a grocery store or whatever. Oh, they got a big smile on their face. They're happy. Everybody's good. Even some of your own friends, they'll, they'll act like everything's great until you get alone with them, and all of a sudden they start opening up and they realize, you realize that, boy, they've got, there's a lot going on in their life. And what they really need to know, they need to know, is there hope? for the situations that they are in. Because the world we li are living in right now, the world we're, that's around us, and see, for us as believers, you know, we talk about having hope in Christ, and we, we talk about the, 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 the wonder of the hope that God has given to us, but it's unfair of us not to share that hope with people who have a hopeless outlook. And that's what Matthew was doing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to encourage you to take the role of Matthew, to take on that role, and to begin to work toward that. And one of the things that we're going to be doing, and, and, and what I want to do tonight is I want to show this. It's about a 30-minute film, and I want to show this to you because it, it, it cross-sections three unique people and their life and the, the encounter, the defining moments that came to their lives. So I want you to pay attention to it, and after we finish it, we'll come back and we're going to talk a little bit more, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap things up uh, with uh, some, some things that we'd like for you to, to challenge you with. Can you guys uh, dim the lights and put that on? You know how many minutes there are in a day? 1,440. Do you know how many hours there are in a week? 168. It's interesting to me that rich people cannot buy more hours. Scientists cannot invent new minutes. You cannot even save time to spend it on another day. You've got a little time today. You say, well, I'd like to save it up for tomorrow. You can't do that. Do you number your days? Do you realize how important every single day is? It all comes down to this moment for Super Bowl 42. That day we were the underdogs. It was a game many thought was over before we even played. Unless the Giants can come back here, the undefeated Patriots are poised to make Super Bowl history. I knew I was open, but I wouldn't be open for long. Direct snap to Manny. Back to throw. The rush. As I look back, it was easy to see Eli was under duress. He's going to be hit. He's going to be sacked. No, no, he got out of it. Unbelievable. I remember the first moment when I became completely blown away and intrigued with the idea of being a magician. That was the moment that I knew that I could actually be good at this. It is the most fun thing in the world to me. a lot more than answers and what a magic trick does is it forces you into a place of questioning and it pulls the rug of reality out from underneath you to where you're literally left in a place where you don't know what is happening I was 14 and I recorded my first song. My mom actually helped me to record it 
she had some recording gear and it was the most amazing thing to hear yourself recorded. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would be a musician for a living. I didn't even think that was possible. As a magician, you're very skeptical, and you realize that most of what's going on behind the scenes is fake or false. The idea of an all-powerful god seems incredibly silly. And when I talk to people that would go to church, I can remember thinking that they were just falling for a simple magic trick. It's like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain controlling everything. grown up understanding how to make people believe something was real when it was really not. I am a master of phoniness. I'm a, I'm a charlatan by craft. But I began to ask myself a big God question. I said, God, if you are real, then I need you to bring me back behind the curtain. I need you to show me how it works. And I need you to make this so real to me that I cannot ignore it. never forget the day this man walks into my room and he said, Mr. Monroe, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have, you have cancer. I said, what? And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Monroe, he said, we cannot cure you of your disease. My wife and I were we were in a bad place. God, where are you? I guess you aren't that great. I had been married for five years. I had just a three-year-old girl and a two-year-old little boy. And I needed, I needed more time with my family. I needed more time. Giants drafted me in the sixth round of the 2003 draft, and uh, it was it was everything that I was looking for. You know, I had some tremendous challenges uh, through college, and getting on, getting the field, getting the recognition, and now I felt like you know th th this is finally it. So it was it was about that it was about that glory for me as as a rookie, and I, I just enjoyed every moment of it. Most people would like to think that, you know, money would solve all your problems. And I found that the money only multiplied the evils that were in my life. It just gave me access to more of the things that I craved the most, whether, you know, if I had women, it just, you know, it just made me that much more likable by women. If I, I loved it, I loved alcohol. Now I was able to get all the alcohol I wanted. I love, you know, now, whereas maybe in time past, I didn't have marijuana. Now I'm able to buy all the marijuana that I wanted. You know, I was one person in public and, and, a, and a totally different person in private. My struggles with alcohol were a lot more than just having a good time and getting wasted and laughing away. I was totally, you know, just inebriated to the point where I couldn't keep my composure. 
there were times where my blackouts, you know, led me to places where I woke up the next day and naked in a bed and not knowing, you know, what happened the night before. You know, I smoked weed every single day throughout my rookie year, and I began to not just smoke the weed, I began to sell the weed. I'll never forget those sirens in my rearview mirror, the sound and, and how my heart dropped in that very moment. You know, being asked to get out that car and, uh, and them searching the car and pulling out that the half a pound of marijuana. And uh, it was a deflating moment in my life. For the first time, you know, as I was being pulled into that Fort Lee jail cell, I realized that I was broken. You know, I was broken and there was no one to look at other than myself. On the outside, you look great, but deep inside, you're searching for something you haven't yet found. There must be something else in life than this. When I was a little girl, we kind of struggled financially. My mom being a single mom with Two kids at 18. It was obviously it was a difficult situation to be in. When I was 10 years old, my cousin, who was three, was like a little brother to me. He was beaten to death by his stepfather. How could I trust in a God that would allow something like that to happen? It just spiraled into depression, and I ended up hanging out with people who had issues like mine in their life and ended up getting involved in drugs and just continued to fuel that depression. When I was 16, I was a um, very outspoken atheist and really searched a lot of different religions and just felt so empty in everything, whether it was in drugs or sex or even just deep thinking and philosophies. It just seemed to all leave me really empty. And uh, since there wasn't anything in life that satisfied the emptiness, I just didn't want to do life anymore. There were times I cried myself to sleep at night. I made a plan to commit suicide. I just didn't want to wake up anymore. I just was tired of waking up, and I just thought, I can't keep doing this. Only to The day I planned to commit suicide, I came home from school early and my grandma wasn't supposed to be home. And she just had a way of knowing, knowing when something was wrong. And, and she just looked at me and said, something's wrong with you, you're going to church. And that was the last place in the world I wanted to be. I hated Christians, I hated church. And I was like, there's no way I'm gonna go to church. And we got into a crazy screaming match, and I just remember saying, if you'll just shut up, I'll go. And when it's over, then I'll commit suicide. Millions are crying, what can I do to be saved from the pressures of life? The pressures are just so great. We have great technology to save time, but we have less time than ever. The tensions in the home, problems at work, health problems, making ends meet. We want to scream at life. We want to escape from life. Adlai Stevenson once said, it's not the days of your life, but the life in your days that count. You have so much time, but for what? The things that are broken in your heart and life can be restored in Christ. If you put your faith and your confidence in him, he died on the cross. He rose from the dead for you. He wants to give you guidance in your life. He wants to give you a peace and joy and assurance that if you died, you'd go to heaven. But first, there must be a change. You must turn around. That's called repentance in the Bible. Repent. When I was in that jail cell, 
I really just knew I was at the end of my own strength. I realized I'm 24 years old, NFL Special Teams Rookie of the Year, New York Giants Rookie of the Year, and I got everything that anybody could potentially want, but it didn't lead to anything apart from decay and death and disappointment. And I was broken. You know, I was broken, and, you know, and I realized that, you know what, there was no one to look at other than myself. And at that moment, nothing else mattered. I, I just knew I needed something more. I just cried out in desperation and just said, God, all I know is I need you. And that following weekend, after I got arrested, I ended up in the back of a church in a fetal position, crying and weeping out to God. I could no longer resist God's love. As I received God's forgiveness, I knew that I was, I was new. The person of Jesus Christ was now a reality in my life. It wasn't just a myth. It wasn't just a figment or this, this idea. The forgiveness of sins is what actually sets man free. And I was immediately transformed. I knew that I experienced a, a love that, was, that had changed my life forever. And I knew there was never going to be any looking back for me. is collapsing on us. How much longer do we have? The psalmist requested that the Lord remember how short my time is. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I'm withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Think of it. God will endure forever. But on this earth, we're like a shadow. It's declining. We're all dying. From the moment you were born, you started dying. How much longer do we have? The cancer doctor looked at me and said, Mr. Monroe, I said, we cannot cure you of your disease. And there is something, however, that we would like to try. It's called a bone marrow transplant. The problem with your body is that your white blood cells are making bad copies of bad copies. Your body is deceiving itself. It's playing a trick on itself. So what we need to do is we need to completely destroy your system. And what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to find someone in the world whose DNA matches yours close enough to grow a brand new immune system, a brand new blood system from scratch. We're going to substitute someone else's perfect blood on your behalf so that you can live again. God said without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There has to be a substitute for you who will take the judgment that you deserve, the death that you deserve. And that substitute became Jesus Christ. I was thinking to myself, man, my time is running out. I am dying of cancer. It's been hard to deal with right now. Peyton is three years old and Gavin is two years old. My two babies, should this take my life early? I love you. They began the most vicious concoction of chemo. The goal of which was not just to destroy the cancer in my body, but was literally to destroy me. It was hell. It was a slow death. I really am scared. I'm really trying not to be fearful, but I am fearful. I'm trying to be strong for my wife and for my, for my family. But uh, I'm pretty scared. We are waiting to hear from the National Bone Marrow Donor Program, 7 million people currently registered on the database. And there was one perfect match for me, just one. It was a 19-year-old female. They said, Mr. Monroe, your bone marrow transplant is scheduled for April 23rd. You're going to get a brand new birthday. They said, you are going to be like a baby inside the womb all over again. The nurses celebrate your new birth in the hospital. And I had heard that terminology before, too, somewhere at the churches that I had attended. But literally, I was going to be born anew. 
And then I'll never forget on April 23rd, they brought this bag of blood into my room and everyone was hoping in that moment that my body would receive that new life, that new blood. I sit here today, 100% completely cancer free. And when they look at my blood today, they see a 19 year old female. They see her, they see XX chromosome. I'm reminded of a verse in Galatians 2. It says, uh, it's no longer I who live, but it's someone else who lives on the inside of me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith. John 17, 3, it says, This is eternal life, knowing you, God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I'm fully convinced of the claims of Jesus as a skeptical person and as an illusionist. I know that the God of the universe has brought me back behind the curtain just like I asked him to. Cancer was how he did it through my life. And there's a spiritual cancer that's eating us away on the inside. And we're all longing, we're all begging for someone to step in and to save us from that condition. God looks at your heart and God sees that you have a spiritual heart disease. And that spiritual heart disease is called sin. And we're all sinners. That means we've broken the laws of God. We've disobeyed God. We've rebelled against God. And because we've rebelled against him, we're going to have to face a judgment. Oh yes, there's coming a judgment. There'll be some day when you will stand before God at the great judgment day and you'll have to give an account of your life here and you'll have to give an account of what you did with Jesus Christ on this very night. Because there's going to be a judgment. But God's judgment it's also tempered by his love and his mercy. He's willing to forgive you tonight. He's willing to give you a chance tonight. No matter how much time you've wasted in the past, you can still have tomorrow. I was sitting in the back of the church slouched down in my chair with my arms crossed and the preacher began to speak and everything he said was straight to my heart like I was the only person in the room and he stops in the middle of what he's saying and he says there's a suicidal spirit in the room and God wants you to know that he loves you all the hair stood up on the back of my neck I was like this is just really freaking me out I gotta get out of here I got up and went towards the door after he dismissed the church and a man grabbed me by the arm and he was a white-headed old man and he said, God wants me to speak to you and he wants you to know that even though you've never known an earthly father, that he will be a better father to you than any earthly father could ever be. He said, he's seen you when you cry yourself to sleep at night. And when he said that, it really shook me because I cried myself to sleep every night since I was 10 years old. If I didn't cry, I couldn't sleep. But he said he sees you when you cry yourself to sleep at night. And he loves you so much. And he sent his son Jesus to die and bleed on a cross to take all of the pain that you're experiencing on himself. So you don't have to experience it. He said, do you want him to take that from you? Because he died to take it. And I was like, well, you can try it. <laughs> you know, he was like, can I pray for you for that? And I was like, you can try it. I don't really believe in all this, but I know something crazy is happening right now. And so he put his hand on my shoulder and began to pray. And he said something like, God, I pray that you would wrap your arms around your daughter and let her know how much you love her. In my life, I searched something to satisfy the longing in my heart and every time I come away emptier than before and in that moment 
It's something you just can't explain that you have to experience where I literally felt like I was in front of the God of the universe. And the thing that I noticed, first of all, was that this God was so holy and awesome, and I was so not that. Some of you think that you're too bad to come to God, have done too many things and gone too far. God's not waiting to judge you. God's not waiting to condemn you. God loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you, to shed his blood for you. He wants to put his arms around you and receive you, and he will take you and forgive you and love you and be your friend. This God was so holy and awesome. And if God had said, go away, it would have been right. It would have been justice for me. I know it. But the craziest thing was that he's drawing me in and taking me into his arms and saying, I love you just the way you are. I'm not shocked by any of this. And if you let me, I will make you new. I'm just so thankful that God sees us different than we are. He doesn't turn away, but he still looks at us with love. It's amazing to think that God is a father like that. Jesus died in my place. And because of that, all I have to do is believe it and say, yes, change me. Yes, make me new. In Romans, the sixth chapter says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In 1 Peter, it says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. He became sin. Think of it. Jesus Christ, this pure, this wonderful, the greatest person that ever lived, the holiest person that ever lived, the son of the living God, became sin. He had never known sin. And he became guilty at that moment of adultery. He became guilty of lying, of idolatry. He became guilty of every ugly, dirty thing you can think of because it was your sins poured out on him. Through Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. You say, well, Billy, what in the world do I have to do? First, you must repent of your sins. The apostle Peter said, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins be blotted out. What does repentance mean? Repentance means that you come to God and say, God, I'm sorry I've sinned. And we're all guilty. Every one of us, everyone that's ever been born is guilty. Have you repented? Are you sure of it? It means that you not only say, God, I'm sorry. It means that you ask him to help you to turn from your sins, to change your way of living, to get rid of those old habits you shouldn't have. And then you must come by faith, by Without faith, it's impossible to please him. The word faith means that you totally trust. The scripture says in Romans 4, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I have to have righteousness to get into heaven, and I don't have any. Billy Graham is a sinner. I don't have any righteousness of my own. I come in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you can work your way to heaven, you'd get up to heaven and boast to everybody. Look what I did. I was such a good person. I got here on my own. You get there totally because of Christ. The fact that time is short calls for us to do something about it now because the scripture says in 
2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the accepted time, not tomorrow, today. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. You can harden your heart. You hear a message like this and it can be very dangerous because you'll harden your heart. And the next time you hear the gospel, your heart will be harder and harder and harder. Come to Christ now. If there's even a whisper in your heart that you need to come, you come and say, Lord, you have all of me tonight. I want to be sure that I'm ready to meet you. Come now. If you'd like to receive Christ, then you can pray a prayer like I did. Or like I did. Like I did. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. And I want to turn from my sins. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died for my sin and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as Lord. From this day forward, Jesus, I put my trust in you, and I surrender my life to you. And I surrender my life to you. I surrender my life to you. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 the time Jesus is talking to us. Let us pray now while Jesus is here, okay? Father, we just thank you right now. At this particular time, Father, you knew you knew things like this were going to happen to us. But you was waiting. You was waiting, Lord God, for us to say, Jesus, here I am. I'll repent for all our sins, Lord God. All the sins that we commit against you, Lord Jesus. We come to you tonight. Father, we're not perfect. Father, we break down every wall, every stronghold in our life. We break down everything that's not like you. Father God, we know that we have pride. We break pride down, Lord Jesus. We surrender to you tonight, Lord Jesus, that you may have everything that we have belongs to you. Father, we throw those things away that not belongs to you. Father, we thank you right now for tonight. We thank you for our pastor who allowed this to happen, Lord God. We thank you for our Billy Graham. We thank you for more and more that you've given to us and bringing to us tonight, Lord God. Father, touch the heart of men and women and children in this place tonight. Don't let the heart be hard, Lord Jesus. Open up the heart, Father. Let tears begin to flow. Let arms begin to spread out, begin to hug and to kiss on each other. Oh, God, we need you. We need you like we never need you before, Lord God. Oh, God, we are friends of yours. You are friend. Let us become friends of each other, Lord Jesus. Touch us. Touch everybody in this place, Lord God. Oh, let the Holy Spirit move. Move on everybody, Lord, and raise them up from the place that I used to be to the place you want them to be, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. This message will have to go before you. This message will have to go in, into the world, Lord God. We cannot allow Satan to stop us from doing this, Jesus. We got to go. This is what you call us to do, is to be a witness to you, Lord God. If nobody don't go, Lord God, I am going to do what you call me to do. Lord, there be many. If there be you out there want to go and do what God called you to do, raise your hand tonight. Do not be afraid. Just raise your hand. Say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Use me. Hallelujah. One, two, three, four, five. Five is willing to do what God asked him to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that five. Hallelujah. What we're going to do now, we have some paper that we're going to sign. If you have anybody in your heart that you 
often think of that you need to pray for. We're going to pass these out for you to put their names on. Brother Tom, you give us a hand here. This is the hour, this is the time. Time is running out. We cannot stand by and say, well, he's going to do it. We cannot stand by and say, well, pastor going to do it. No, God has called you to do it. He called each one of us to do it. We have a work to do, so let's do it. When I ask you to raise your hand, only five people raised their hand that they was willing to do the work that God called them to do. I don't know what you think I was talking about. I was talking about just telling people about Jesus. I'm not talking about going to Chicago and witness to anybody. I mean, just tell people about Jesus. Now, this Matthew thing that we're talking about, we read in the Bible how Matthew was, was a tax collector. And we know that the people that Matthew hung around with, they was most all sinners. So when Matthew got saved, he, he had already made a lot of money. So he threw a house party. And the party that he threw, he invited all his friends. Now, can you imagine all those people came? They were sinners. But Jesus came. And his disciples came. And can you imagine the thing that took place in that building when Jesus Christ came there? When his disciples came in? So what we are doing tonight we are doing a Matthew friends, and we hope Jesus is in this house tonight. And not only tonight, we hope Jesus Christ is in your life every day of your life. And we hope Jesus Christ will be in the place that if anybody sign up to be Matthew, to invite some friends, we want to invite sinners to your house. You go to the service station, you go to any place, Invite somebody over for Christmas that's not saved. Invite somebody over for, that's what we talked about when we went to this conference down there. We talked about sinners coming to your house, even though your friends came. But invite somebody that, that you know is not saved. That's who we're trying to reach. We're trying to reach the sinners. And Jesus has called us to reach the sinners. When this man that is speaking tonight He's old. God still gave him something to do through us. When he, this, when he sit down and say, I'm too old to move around, it doesn't mean that we're not going to witness. We're still here. And we're going to do the work that God called him to do. Now, we are connected to the same spirit that he's connected to. It's the Holy Spirit. And we'll have no other spirit than the Holy Spirit. We're not connected to the other kind of spirits. So the same spirit that Billy Graham has, we have it. So you sign your name, the name of the, the people you have on, on your list, and we're going to pray for them too. Now, let me say this again. Maybe, maybe I was moving a little too fast because I was so excited. I, I was telling Bishop, I said, this is awesome. This is awesome video. I've seen it more than more than two, three times. It's really, every time I see it, it's just, it just touched my heart. It really does. How many people here tonight are just willing to witness to people for Jesus Christ? Now, you don't have to catch a plane and go to Russia. Just every day with you. Every day. That's what God wants you to do. There are sinners who pass on the street. There are sinners. I work with so many sinners now. I, I, I just pickings is so good. This is picking is good. God always put me in the pickings. You know, the harvest is just ready. To say, say the fields is white. They're already ready for pickings. The harvest is ready. What, is, what are we waiting for? The time is here. The hour is here. The time is running out. We must go forward. We cannot go backwards. Okay? Now, Anybody, most of us know how, this, how to do this uh, house party because we, we've been doing this all along, really, haven't we? But this time we want to invite people we don't know. Friends can come. But just, if it's not but one person at a time, just have a meal with you that's not saved. See, you bring him or her 
See, we have another video. It shows that how they invite uh, sinners to their home, like people that work with them. They're not saved. So they say, well, you know, we're having another get-together tomorrow night at our home. Would you just come by? Well, you know, I don't know. I got something to do. Well, they kept asking, and pretty soon they came by, and they weren't saved. And they got saying that, that very night on the video. And that could happen at our own home. Invite sinners to your house. Bring some friends that you know, you feel a little comfortable. But sinners are what we are trying to bring to Jesus Christ. So any question, Pastor, you want to come up? What we, uh, what we would like to see happen here is for people to, to pray, first of all, and ask the Lord to say, you know what, God, there's people in my family, my circle of friendships that don't know Jesus Christ, people that I communicate with, I have, I have friendships with, I deal with on a daily basis, and, and I want to I wanna strategically place my life before them so that they can have an opportunity to hear about the hope that Christ has given to me. So what we're, what we're doing is we've got, we've got a, uh, for anyone that would like to have a home party, if you will, or to invite your friends uh, and, and loved ones that you know to your home for a gathering to watch a film like that. How many of you think a film like this would touch somebody's life? There's three of these, three different types, three different uh, things that have testimonies of people uh, that where Christ has changed them. It's a video like this, and Billy Graham speaks through it, uh, throughout it, just like that. And uh, to give the message of Jesus Christ. And then what happens is that during the course of that event, it may be, you may invite two or three people or, or one person for that matter. Uh, it may be a host of people. You may have a group. But you, you play the video. It's about a 30-minute video. You play the video. You watch it. And then you come and then you share your testimony of what Christ has done for you. You share that. For some people, some of you have never shared your testimony with anybody. You've never told anyone. And then some of you sh share your testimony all the time. And that's, uh, that's wonderful because that's, you know, really what it's all about. This gives you an opportunity. It's in your home, to your friends, people that your, your circle of relationships gives you a chance to do that. We have, we have a, um, we, we'll have video uh, uh, that help you to understand the best way to do the invitations, the best way to share with people. And uh, really the strategy is, a, it's a simple strategy. There's not a, a huge, uh, like, thing you have to do. But if you look on the, on the, the paper, there's, there's some things. He just says this. He says, this is what you do. Look around, look up, look out, look forward, and look after. And he says this. He says, look around and identify friends, neighbors, coworkers, fellow students, and family who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Write their names down on the, on the list you have. Look up and pray every day for those persons that's on your list. Look out for opportunities to build a relationship with those people. Look forward to the event and invite each of those people that's on your list and, and prepare a three-minute story and pray for God's help as you invite your guests to come and then invite them to receive Jesus Christ. And then look after those whose lives have been changed by Jesus Christ and they come into faith with Christ. And so, you know, it's a simple thing. You invite them, you watch the video, you share, and then you ask. It's a simple thing. This has already been done around the world. Uh, in, in different parts of the world, Billy Graham and his uh, uh, organization have already went around the world, and they have seen f just phenomenal uh, things happen around the world with this type of uh, thing. I'm not saying this is for everybody, but I am saying this. If you're looking for a way, you're looking for an opportunity that you can invite your friends, that you can't get them to church, they won't come. They don't want to come to church right now. But you can get them to your home. If you'll take and strategically plan and pray to bring them into your home and be a Matthew for one day, who knows? It could literally impact the life of somebody for eternity. That's the key. You have an opportunity. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're a teenager and you say, well, gee, I don't, I, you know, I have to ask my mom if I can have people over, you know, have my friends. Have you ever, teenagers, let me ask you something. Have you ever thought about inviting your friends over to do nothing but just talk about God? No, you'll talk about everything else, though. You could have a homework party. 
You can do homework and then throw the video. Hey, I got a video I want you to watch. And then take that video and play that video and let them watch because you know what? They need to know there's hope. Because you know what? Some of those kids that you know, and you, I bet you right now in, in, your, in your circle of relationship with kids, there's probably kids that you know that have, that have contemplated suicide, have even attempted suicide, and maybe even right now are thinking about committing suicide. Right now. There's people that you know in your relationships and friendships that you're, you're associated with on various levels that have gotten themselves strung out on alcohol and drugs and and they're, they're in all kinds of marriages are, are, are bottoming out. Things are happening to their life. And you know what, folks? I know people think, we look at tragedies that happen in people's lives and we say, oh, you know, it's really sad, it's really sad. No, that's the best opportunity you have. It's one of the best opportunities, one of the biggest doors of opportunity that open up for you to be able to share Jesus Christ with people. Because it's through those moments, God uses those moments in their life. People, when their things are going good, they're not even thinking about God. They don't care about God. I'm having too much fun in my life. But you know what, like the, like the guy you know, that played for the New York Giants, I remember that catch. Remember that catch? I remember that catch. Wow. That was unbelievable. Who would have ever known that that guy was smoking dope every day? Every day. Drinking till he was blitzed out of his head. Who would have known that? Because on the outside, everything looked like he had it all together. He had everything there is. How many people do you know like that? That they act like everything is, you, you look at them and say, well, they, surely they don't have anything going on in their life. Nothing could be possibly wrong with them. You have no idea the devastation that, is, that they're living through every single day and how the enemy of their soul is ravaging them and robbing them of their very existence. And God has put you into their life to bring life and hope to them. And that's why what we're asking you to do is just this, that piece of paper, whether you have a Matthew party at your house or not, ten people, five people, three people that you know, that right now in your heart you say, God, you know what? These people need Jesus. Just write their name down. Just write it down on a piece of paper and start praying over them. Just start praying over them. Because you have no idea what God can do Never underestimate one encounter, one moment, one phone call, one, one event that can literally change their whole life for all of eternity. And you know what? You don't have to go, like Brother Oscar, you don't have to go to Africa, you don't have to go to Russia. All you got to do is go right next door to your neighbor. That person you talk to all the time, that, that, that lady that you see at the grocery store that you have struck up a thousand conversations with as you were paying for your groceries. Those individuals that you know, people that are close to you, people that you have built relationships with. And you know, those kind of relationships are important. And, and, and we're, we're, we're living in this time. And I, I, you know, when I was, when I was at the, at watching that film yesterday, I, I shared this with you a moment ago. When, when I was watching that film, I couldn't help but, but feel the, the, the heart of God, you know, just saying to, to his church, church, I'm doing everything I can, everything I can to put into your hands tools that you can use to touch people with the gospel message. I'm using film, I'm using technology, I'm using internet, I'm using anything and everything that, that's out there. And I'm giving you an opportunity, giving you a chance. Because here's the reality for all of us that profess to be believers in Jesus Christ. We all will stand before him. All of us. And the judgments that God brings to the lives of people are not the judgments on the things that, that you did, the bad stuff you did. The judgment on the church is you heard Billy Graham's pitch. You listened to the word every Sunday. You even experienced life change in your own personal life. And yet when I asked you to tell your neighbor or talk to your friend, you disobeyed me.
and didn't do it. You let fear get in the way. You let other things get in the way. And all you had to do was just make an invitation. That's all. Such a simple thing. Come on over for a party. Come on over and have dinner with us. Come over, we're going to have just to get together. We'll, have, we'll, 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 we'll play some games. We'll, we'll, we'll do some things. But we're going to watch a, a film. We're going to talk. And then I'm going to share with you a personal story that happened in my life. It may be the very thing that they needed. Who knows? So I'm asking you to think about it. If you're interested in being one of those Matthews, if you really are interested in that, um, we'd like for you to let us know because we would like to put into your hands. We're going to have a, between now and the, the event that's going to happen in November, we're going to be able to uh, give, have uh, some moments where we can train and uh, talk a little bit more about those that really would like to open their homes up to do this. Um, that you really, you know, feel, hey, God, you know, this is something I could do. This is something I could, I could really do to, to reach out to my friends. And we'll have a, a, a video presentation to give you some things that you can watch. There's uh, uh, eight simple things that you can, you can watch and, and learn from and help you to grow so that you can be more confident in what you're doing and uh, to be able to encourage people around you. So and we'd like for you to do that. And if you're interested in that, please, we'd like you to let Brother Oscar know. Um, those names of things that you have that you're writing down, Put them on your refrigerator. Put them on the mirror of your dresser. Put them on the mirror of the vanity in your bathroom. Wherever you can go, wherever you can see those names, and say, God, these are the people. These are the, these are the individuals, God, that, I, that I, I'd love to see. Wouldn't it be wonderful if sitting next to you at Christmas this year would be somebody that you personally invited to Jesus Christ and they came and that this would be the greatest gift you could have ever given them. That they could sit with you on a Sunday morning in service. What an impact that can make. What a change that can be for your life and for ours. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for the word of the Lord. Thank you for giving us the opportunity again to be stirred in our spirit concerning this. I know, Lord, that, that when we write names down, sometimes, God, we write names down. We don't even really think about it. We just write them down, or we don't even think about names. We don't even write them down. They're going to go home tonight. And, God, I'm just asking you by the Holy Spirit, because you have a way of saying things I can't say and doing things I can't do. You can meet them where they are. There's, there's somebody, God, that they know. They'll, they'll probably come in contact with them tomorrow, day after, sometime this next week. But it will remind them, yeah, that person. That individual right there, that's the person. God, I, I want them to see Christ. I want them to come to you. I want their life to be changed. Lord, without you, they don't have any hope. And those names that we write down, the, the, the people that we put their names on that list, Lord, let it be a daily reminder to us. And then God, out of, the, out of the group that's here tonight and others that are within our congregation, perhaps, Lord, there are those that would say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to take a, the biggest risk of my life. I'm going to open up my home, and I'm going to invite some friends to come over. And I'm going to share this video, and I'm going to share my faith. I'm going to share it with them. I'm going to tell them what God did for me. And I'm even going to give them an invitation to come to know Christ as I've known Christ. Father, I just ask you to stir up our hearts. Let us not be so enamored by the world that we live in. Let us not be so close-minded by the things that we're hearing and seeing in our world where, God, we've lost our hope. But rather, God, let us, in the midst of all of this, realize that we have found the hope, and it's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So, God, I want to thank you again. Thank you for this time. Thank you for people who have come tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the word. And God, thank you for the vision that you've given to a 95-year-old evangelist who still believes that as long as there's breath in his body, that he wants to share the good news with somebody. For that we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great night. May the Lord bless you. Take those home and uh, let us know what you think, okay?